Okay. Uh, tonight's presentation is how to conduct a vessel safety check on paddlecraft. Uh, my name is Roland McDevitt. I'm the division chief for paddlecraft safety. Our presenters are Mark Morositz of Newport, Rhode Island. Mark is a member of our national team, a sailor, a paddler, and a kayak instructor, and a commu communications consultant. So he's a very valuable member of our national team. He's really uh, he's really helped us up our game. Uh, with uh, Mark is Mike Maloney, originally from Ireland, uh, now in Casco Bay, Flotilla, and Portland, Maine. Uh, he's done an amazing job of getting that program off the ground up there. There seems to be a tremendous amount of energy in uh, Division District 1. And I know there's a lot of uh, sea kayaking, I think, is more popular up that way than it is down here. So it's kind of exciting to get the program going in an area where uh, where there's a big sea kayaking community, although our target audience is primarily recreational kayakers. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us tonight, and I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Great. Um, thanks, Roland, and good evening, everybody. It's uh, good to, to meet you all. Uh, the, the presentation tonight uh, is really being road tested. Um, the national team and Mike, and we've all worked on it. Um, I piloted it about two weeks ago with um, District 1, Division 7, about 30 uh, uh, vessel examiners in attendance. So assuming that many of you know a lot about vessel exams and a uh, good number of you know a lot about paddling, I want you to see the presentation in the format that it was delivered but I'm gonna highlight uh, especially those points that either um, we find important um, as paddlers and paddlecraft educators and or which these VEs raised particular points or seem to have particular knowledge gaps. So let me dive right in. Um, focus of the, the presentation is the why, what, who, you know, where, um, with a particular emphasis on the how and the making the exam as effective as possible, um, recognizing that a fair number of vessel examiners um, are not avid paddlers, may not be familiar with, with the craft, and also that this is primarily a safety education opportunity. And that also, our goal was to alert um, vessel examiners to the idea that um, in the same way that you might be very comfortable educating about boating safety, um, time to raise your game and feel more comfortable around paddle education if you aren't already. Um, so the first question clearly is, uh, is a kayak or a stand-up paddle, paddle board a vessel? Um, the answer is absolutely yes. And I found that in our session, not everyone was um, necessarily aware um, of the application of the regulations. And for example, here in Rhode Island, um, DEM just passed a state reg that um, life vests, PFDs must be worn. It's not an option, it's the law now. So raising that kind of awareness was important. The other really important conversation I think for all of us is that while paddlers, um, their, pad their paddle craft may be vessels, but most of us, many of us paddlers are not boaters. And therefore, when those of us who came to the auxiliary as boaters were, were very comfortable about talking about water properties like fetch and tidal current and um, talking about wind speeds and changeable wind speeds and um, talking about uh, aids to navigation, that many, many paddlers, particularly the beginning to um, novice paddler, who's our primary target, don't talk or think in the, in the same way. And, and that's a, just an important awareness part for those doing the exams. And obviously um, ownership has skyrocketed. COVID uh, literally sold out the kayak stores here in Rhode Island and therefore mishaps are rising. And at least here in our part of the world, fatalities have been rising. So this is really important. And as you all know, or you wouldn't be on the call tonight, prevention works. Um, so all types of paddle craft are eligible. Um, this presentation focuses mainly on kayaks and SUPs. 
Um, there are a lot of people though in the auxiliary working on um, river boats and, and other types of paddle craft and there'll be more and more content for that I'm sure as um, things evolve. Um, understanding who may conduct the, the vessel safety check, obviously a qualified vessel examiner or a trainee, but I highlighted here that paddling experience is useful. Paddle practical knowledge of craft and gear is, is necessary um, if we're going to achieve the um, full safety education mission. And I'll point that out as I go along a few places where that knowledge really um, comes in very, very handy. And of course, it's pretty easy to get that knowledge. Um, those of us that are um, have OxPad programs going are happy to have vessel examiners come to our classes. We're happy to do special classes. I had some VEs ask if they could come out on the water with me. And you know, I think it's all good. We, we can all help each other with our skills. Um, where can these um, activities be conducted? Um, clearly there's a lot of places. Um, I have found personally that the put-ins and the launch points at, at towards the end of the day, at the ends of paddles, um, have been very beneficial as well as um, uh, the events that have been held in the area, specifically asking for paddlers to attend. I have not done much with sales and rental venues, but I work for the Harbor Master here in Newport, and we are doing a full court uh, press outreach to all the livery companies that are kind of drop and go companies now. So lots of opportunities. Um, clearly in, in going through this with, with examiners, as you'll see, we do it by the form and connect it back to the form and always notice that and remind them that on the back of the form, there are prompts and tips and uh, other ideas as they move their way through um, the vessel examination. Um, you all know the chapter and verse about you know how how to dress and how to conduct yourself. Um, in terms of the approach, um, you know what a nice uh, paddleboard that is, or what a great kayak. Talking about the routes that people paddle, and this is where one of the areas where knowledge comes in because. If the route they always paddle is an estuary or the route they always paddle is open water, it helps if you have some some of your own awareness of uh, where people paddle in your, your area of operation. Um, I have also found the if found sticker is a great first item. I, I walk up, I introduce myself as a member of the Coast Guard Auxiliary, ask them if they have a sticker in their boat um, or on their craft and um, invariably um, most don't, but they ask the question, what is it? Um, I carry markers. If they want to do it right there, that's great. But um, that sticker is just a great springboard to that first introduction. And then the conversation follows about vessel safety checks and educational opportunities. Um, you know what the form covers from knowing um, what a vessel examination is. I'll touch on some of these now as we uh, talk about um, kayaks and stand-up battlecraft. So the owner operator information section, it's really um, most important to learn about the, the paddler's knowledge and training and to introduce the um, instructional resources that are available through the auxiliary um, and the American Canoe Association, whereas I'm sure you all know we have a strong partnership and can share curriculum and educational resources. So the first question, obviously, uh, have you attended a safe boating class? Um, that's a chance of whether the answer is yes or no to be able to talk about more classes that are available through the ACA and um, the Coast Guard. Um, some of the folks up here in District 1 and I'm sure in other districts will carry a laminated card, maybe on a lanyard um, that has a link to either the um, local course directory if it's uh, listed by the division or otherwise, but it's a great way to um, have on hand where people might look to for future um, education. Um, when it gets to paddlecraft information, um, again, talking about the craft itself is one thing, but it really opens the door to finding out about the conditions where the paddler paddles 
and to discuss the strengths and limits of their craft for those conditions. And I'm going to show you a few things in a minute where different styles of kayaks are adapted to different kinds of water. So you as the examiner, knowing whether they're largely a flat water paddler or they get out there and mix it up where um, the sea state can change and, and you got some you got some wave heights, you've got a lot of wind is really vital. Um, and there's a question that helps us get there. So unless required by state reg regulation, um, most um, paddlecraft don't have registration numbers, but some states do. But almost all are going to have a hull identification number. Um, sometimes that's imprinted on the stern. Sometimes that's in a small plaque, uh, often on the starboard side of the, the cockpit. And on a paddle board, it's typically on the the on on the fin box um, where the fin is um, fastened to the the body of the the paddle board. Um, and we encourage people to you know take a chance, maybe go as a get a twofer, go visit the local kayaking uh, paddle board store, uh, make it a program visit, but also familiarize yourself with a lot of different kayaks. Um, without the pressure of a, of a vessel exam. It's a great way to um, build some rapport um, on the program visit. Um, make and model is, you know, typically in the form of a graphic. And, and again, great opportunity to uh, make a visit to a local retailer. Um, again, I mentioned that idea of what type of water. This question, watercraft used in protected, open, or, or swift water. Um, Again, I, I, we, we were encouraging our vessel examiners up here because the, you know, the water conditions are so varied. There's so many different paddling environments to really be able to label them and, and understand them and feel comfortable with them. Um, one thing on the kayak side is that all vessel examiners should understand key differences between recreational and sea kayaks when it comes to safety. You'll notice the... Uh, yellow boat in the back you have to maybe look at it a little bit closely but there is a uh, in addition to the cockpit there is a forward and aft hatch it's not so important that there's a hatch it's important that what those hatches do is open um, into a, a compartment with a bulkhead that creates um, two watertight compartments ideally watertight which adds a lot of extra flotation to that style of kayak, that sea kayak. Um, and I'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. These other two um, boats in the foreground um, are open and they do not have those watertight compartments. Um, so as you might imagine, there's some uh, drawbacks to that. This recreational kayak, the, those boats in the foreground, can't really be dewatered after capsize recovery. So um, now I'll say a little more about inflatable float bags. That was a really important topic. But what happens, something like this. Um, and without the ability to dewater and with, you know, uh, I don't know how many gallons of water, there's probably a couple hundred pounds of water in there. Even the rescues that we perform, tea rescues and other rescues can become far more difficult. Um, so again, making that connection when you're doing that vessel exam between, oh, what kind of boat, what kind of gear, what kind of paddling do you do? Might you find yourself in a deep water capsized situation? Do you paddle alone? Very important to be connecting those dots. Um, I mentioned the, the float bags. I'd, I'd spend a little more time on this if we were really doing some in-depth training, but um, I my personal bias is that um, if you have a kayak and it doesn't have bulkheads and compartments, it, it should have flotation bags for um, a myriad of, of reasons in almost any kind of um, emergent situation. Paddle boards, um, I'm not a paddle boarder. I'm learning about them myself, but again, they also come in all shapes and sizes. A visit to my retailer was very helpful. I put the footnote on the bottom here to note that some Paddle boards and also some kayaks are inflatables, and, and that poses some unique um, challenges in the, the vessel exam. I'll get to those in a second. 
So now let's look quickly at the um, safety check requirements. So this is about building paddler awareness of required equipment, but most important, um, why that equipment is important and how to use it. Um, and again, I mentioned that there's talking points on the back of the form, you know, life jackets here, the note is nine out of 10 boaters that drown are not wearing a life jacket. Make sure you have a life jacket that is sized and fitted for you. That's a great reminder. I've learned some things from Mike Maloney. He does some great uh, demonstrations of also why your kayak, why your uh, PFD should be a bright color. Um, he'll put at the end of the room a bright, brightly colored PFD and a camouflage PFD and um, bring those points home. So there's a lot of opportunities to also create your your own prompts for all of these uh, these points in the paddlecraft checklist. Sound signal. Um, whistles and horns, obviously the, the, the easiest, um, life jacket, um, required. And like I mentioned here in Rhode Island, uh, it is the law that you wear it. Um, but it should be required of, of all. And I think that's what we want to encourage. Um, we are, very much opposed to the to inflatables. There's there's a lot of reasons why an inflatable is a, a bad choice for a kayaker. It, it could be entrapment. It could be in your own self-rescue, pulling yourself across a lot of sharp objects and, and deck fittings. It could be that if it doesn't inflate while you're hanging upside down in your kayak, working on your rescue, it's a little hard to find that free hand to unzip and find the self-inflation valve. So um, not all BEs were comfortable with that idea. Um, and I think that might be a, 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 I don't know how universal that is, but um, we like people wearing the the right PFD for um, the type of activity in which they're engaged. Um, so talking about that, again, finding out about their they're paddling, looking at what they have. And then especially, as you all know, do they know how to wear it? Do they know how to wear it tight? Do they know how to, if they have a whistle that it's tied to something? Um, just an opportunity to kind of do a, uh, almost the uniform inspection um, and having them don that life jacket and walking through it then. Um, so um, all vessel examiners that, uh, are examining kayaks and stand-up paddle boards should be able to um, label all of the parts and also understand their value. Um, clearly, I'm not going to walk through all of this, but um, a couple of parts to be really, I think, very much aware of. One is um, in this boat. If you look astern, it has a you know it has an external externally mounted rudder. Some of them have more of a fin-shaped rudder or skeg underneath the vessel that's uh, controlled by a cable. Um, these things really love sand and small rocks and salt water, and they get really stuck. And so a lot of times I will ask um, the paddler, you know, why, why they have a rudder, why they have a fin. I asked the VEs that, that question two weeks ago, and only some are aware of the strong value of that, not just in tracking, but um, kayaks tend to weathercock and you end up spending twice as much energy to get from point A to point B. Um, a lot of times when I've done kayak exams, they've uh, um, those things are stuck and people don't know how to unstick them because they've tried WD-40. WD-40 doesn't dislodge sand and pebbles. So we talk a little bit about technique for that and if not take it to the kayak shop so that was one one um feature we point up a lot another feature is the the shock cords or the deck lines um those are vital for not just keeping your gear on board um, but used extensively in in self-rescue and therefore need to be in great working order and then uh, finally the hip pad thigh brace and um foot pegs. Um, another, this was another topic that came up with the VEs last week. Um, you know, I asked the question, so why do kayaks have hip pads, thigh braces, and foot pegs? Um, 
a couple people got it, but not many were as aware of how much the kayaker's body's connection to the paddle craft had everything to do with um, stability and maneuverability. So again, I, I, my earlier point about understanding paddling and paddle gear, um, it's not just do your foot pegs work and is your hip pad not crumbled away, but can you be talking to that paddler about the relationship between the working order of these pivotal um, fixtures on the vessel and the paddling that they they actually do. Um, same thing on parts of a stand-up paddleboard. Again, they're all they're all different, um, but many have some kind of deck line. Um, many have some kind of surface that's a little less uh, that helps for traction. Um, many all will have some type of um, fin underneath. Um, they also have drain plugs. They have holes for um, paddle leashes. And um, so it, again, connecting this to what the, the paddler does is really critical. I mentioned um, the issue of, you know, um, the inflatables. So one of our checklist items is, you know, is the hull and deck sound. Obviously in boats made of fiberglass or roto mold, um, that can become pretty obvious. Um, and you'd be looking for like the, the hatch covers fit, is there abrasion, how are the seals, um, pretty much a, a, a structural, you know, once over. I mentioned the dock lines and bungee cords before, tight enough to hold something, but not too tight um, that you can't use it for these great pictures Mike took of showing uh, how the, the deck bungees are used um, in a paddle float rescue and, and the importance of those being not too not too sloppy, um, whatever. Um, I mentioned again, the hardware of the, the controls rudders, the hardware that controls your foot pegs, all of those things should be smooth working order, but most importantly, the vessel examiner should understand what they are, why they are, and how they relate to what the paddler wants to achieve. Um, finally, I, I'll mention the inflatable piece. Um, you know, you'll probably see it, those of you that paddle, many people with inflatables, the way they inflate them at shoreline is um, a pump attached to their uh, their car's uh, cigarette lighter or whatever electrical device they have or their battery operated. Um, it's a question of once you go out on the water, um, what happens if the if, if that kayak or that inflatable deflates? It's impossible to know the construction of all of them or how much flotation they have, how many chambers. Um, some are very cheap. Um, so I think it's always a great question um, at shoreside. So um, how stable is your kayak when it deflates? You know, what plans do you have for um, deflation? And again, a lot for all of us as examiners to learn. The boats are different, um, but this again is an area where a visit to the dealers can be helpful because one of the things the dealers are very good at telling you is how some of the stuff that's being sold on Amazon or at the discount shops, how it's made in a really different manner. Uh, so very, very important connection between us and the uh, the retail community. Um, bulkheads, airbags, flotation. I mentioned the airbags. Bulkheads, um, just like anything else that should be watertight, you should be asking the paddler and you should be checking to see if that bulkhead is watertight. Um, best way to do it is um, prop the boat up in an angled condition and put some water in it, see if the water leaks. Um, but I think it's a, you know, it's a question to know they do deteriorate. The seals do deteriorate. Um, airbags, we covered that. And um, that I know that's a pretty fast run through, but I'm talking to an experienced audience. So I'll, uh, pause there and um, maybe we'll take a few questions about this front part of it before Mike rolling into your part. Uh, do we have questions? Uh, Bruce Johnson had a comment earlier about uh, the fact that he's been doing vessel safety checks at his local scout camp for years. 
uh, lots of canoes and kayaks, and that uh, was very much appreciated. Uh, Roland, I have two questions, um, and I apologize if I missed it. If a recreational kayak does not have float bags in it, there's no no uh, flotation. Does that kayak uh, get a decal if everything else is in order? I would say yes. Uh, I don't think there's any specific requirement that uh, I think basically what the form says is that any flotation that there is needs to be you know in good shape uh, but the a lot of times they just have a little bit of foam in each end and it's um, you know there's not really much there to start with is uh, is there anybody else on online here that uh, got a better answer than that um <clears throat> My experience is uh, when I when I see one of their less expensive boats that uh, you know very often that little block of uh, styrofoam that's both forward and aft it, it's just glued in, and truthfully, most of them are gone in a couple of weeks. They the glue doesn't hold, and, and you know the people are not aware of uh, you know how valuable whether it's even there or they've lost it. Uh, but I always encourage people, I say, hey, look, you can you can improve this greatly uh, if you go buy a couple of pool noodles and either tape them up underneath or cut them up in a lot of little sections and put them in a, in a laundry bag and tape it up uh, way up under your bow and again under your stern. And, you know, so that's a, a nearly zero cost uh, repair that I think uh, would would meet the standard uh in terms of uh but yeah i and i've seen some kayaks uh that simply have no flotation at all i mean the you know because of the nature of the plastic they're going to float about an inch under the water but if the people have them loaded down with uh an anchor and some other things they're going to the bottom uh, it's, they're it's just one, not safe it's one thing to, to have enough flotation for the kayak to to stay slightly above water when it's swamped that's another thing to have a kayak that's going to be uh, useful like once you get back into it. Um, and I, I would probably not recommend pool, pool noodles. I I would really try to, if people are going to stick with the recreational kayak, I would encourage them to get float bags. So with regard to these pictures here, these, these were just pictures I took to show the, the float bag inserted inside the boat. Obviously, you would want to see those float bags secured inside the boat. Um, you know, Velcro and a, a clip is a really good way to hold it in place. Um, but you would definitely want to make sure it's secured. When I'm talking to people about recreational boats, I have nothing against rec recreational boats whatsoever. I own multiple of them. But it's really the conversation is about where that boat is being used. Um, if it's on a, a lake in the summertime or a, a calm river and they're close to shore and the water temperatures are good, that's a perfectly appropriate setting for a person to be using a recreational boat that doesn't have flotation attached to it. But if they're heading out on, on the ocean in 58 degree water temperatures, uh, that is not a, a place where that, that boater should be going in a recreational boat. So it's 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 partially about the vessel itself, but partially about the the paddler's knowledge of, of where the appropriate venue use that boat is. In my, that, um, but from what I have always gone by is that a recreational boat, since you really cannot depend on being able to do a recovery into it, should never be used any place where the boater cannot swim or make it to shore safely if he capsizes and has to make it without the with or without his boat. So in that case, you could say, well, the float bags aren't really needed because you shouldn't be there if you need for the boat to float once it's swamped. We had another question. Uh, what about sit on tops? And uh, one thing I've noticed in working with uh, Kitty Hawk kites is that that's all they, that's pretty much what they rent. Uh, because they're very simple. They don't have a whole lot that can go wrong with them. Uh, they don't have hatches and bulkheads and uh, all of those 
things that can uh, can go wrong. Um, so I th I think they're kind of simpler to uh, to inspect, but you can still have all these conversations about where's an appropriate place to to take that uh, that vessel. Hey, Roland, if I could jump in for one quick second as well. This is Jim Cortez. I'm the director of uh, vessel exams. Hey, Jim. If that kayak was equipped with flotation originally, and it no longer has flotation for whatever reason, it fails. Yeah. So yep. I just want to make that that clear and distinct because yep. just like it, just like an engine cutoff switch, if the boat's equipped with an engine cutoff yep. switch, it has an engine cutoff switch. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense, and I and I think uh, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of those new recreational kayaks don't have very much flotation in them in them to start with. And I think I think the second point I wanted to make on the on the the uh, sit on top, you can't sink them. So for somebody who's new at paddling in general, probably a much safer option for them to start with. Yeah, and I I think too, you know, there are a lot of people that have trouble uh, physical limitations or weight. Uh, and it's much easier to get back onto a sit on top than get into a sit inside. Uh, good, uh, good questions and comments. Um, Mike, do you want to start in? Yes. On this part? Yeah. So, Mark, if you could stop, that'd be great. I'm out. All right. Let me get mine going here. There we go. All right. So one of the other critical pieces of equipment when you're doing a vessel safety check on, on a paddle craft is, is the paddle. Uh, it is an essential part of the vessel. It's the propulsion for the vessel, and it's a key part of being able to conduct a rescue with, with the vessel. So when you're looking at the paddle, there's different styles. You can see the Greenland style. That, that's popular with uh, more experienced uh, sea kayakers in particular. I'll see them using that up here in Maine. Uh, and then you have the, the more standard Euro style paddle. That's the one you're more likely to see with recreational paddlers. Uh, some of the key components that you wanna be looking at there in particular is the joint in the center where those paddles come together. You wanna to be taking a look at that to make sure that it's, it's connecting securely. Um, you wanna to look to see if there's any signs of uh, metal fatigue, because if that uh, joint is starting to deteriorate in any way and the paddler is attempting to do a self-rescue, that is the part of the paddle that's gonna fail. That is the part that's gonna, that's gonna snap when they try to put any kind of weight on it to get themselves back into the boat. So when you're looking at that, you wanna be checking that the center joint in particular, and you wanna be checking the places where the paddle connects with the center shaft, that the paddle blades connect with the center shaft just to make sure that everything looks good. There's no cracking, there's no fatigue that's going on there that could uh, compromise the integrity of the paddle. Another thing that's very important is if you have folks, particularly folks that go fishing, uh, they like to get out uh, before sunrise or in the evening, they like to get out. And uh, if they are paddling uh, before sunrise or after sunset, it is required that they have an electric torch or lighted lantern that is visible from a 360 degree uh, angle. So you can see the paddler here in the picture is pretty well equipped. They got a lamp on the front and they, they have a, a 360 light on the back of the paddle that is higher than their head. So it's visible from any direction that a boat might be approaching them. Uh, so just keep in mind that if you are talking to people that are going out after sunset or before sunrise, they should have a light with them. And we were talking a few minutes ago about the importance of reflectors. Reflectors are important, not just at nighttime, uh, because of course, if somebody shines a light on them, it's gonna stand out very much like you can see in the boat here on the left, you can get great visibility uh, from the reflection off that. But it's also very important during the daytime. Uh, you know, I've talked to the folks that are on our uh, boat crews that go out on Casco Bay and, and uh, out on the ocean up here in Maine. And every single one of them will tell you that the thing they see first, before they see the paddler, before they see the kayak, the thing they see is the paddle flash from the reflectors on the paddle. And they can see that from a half a mile away, long before they're able to see that there's a, a kayaker and a kayak in the water. 
So it's a great thing to, to encourage the uh, paddlers to uh, take our uh, reflective kits and put those on the paddle blades and explain how that dramatically increases the visibility during the daytime. Uh, but also if they are paddling in uh, low visibility evenings or mornings, uh, that reflectors will also help them uh, stand out on the water. Uh, if you're going offshore, uh, it is a really good idea to bring some visual distress signals with you. Uh, if you are uh, traveling uh, offshore at night, you are required to have at least three uh, visual distress signals with you. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, Mark was talking about how Rhode Island has just passed a new law, which I think is fantastic, that they re are requiring paddlers not just to have a life jacket in the vessel, but that they should be wearing the life jacket. Uh, every state, up, up here in New England, I can travel to three states in about 20 minutes. And, uh, you know, I, I drive into New Hampshire and the laws are different than they are in Maine. And I drive another 20 minutes and I'm in Massachusetts and the laws there are different than they are in New Hampshire. So it's very, in, when you're in a smaller state, it's very easy for a paddler to cross jurisdictional lines. So it's a good idea to know the different uh, requirements in the different states where your paddlers may be operating in and be able to relate that to them so they have a good understanding of the different requirements for the different states. So let's talk a little bit about open water recommendations. So this is a really good opportunity, especially if you're standing at, at the shore at, by the by the ocean, uh, and you have a, a somebody that's coming along. You know, you can oftentimes tell from looking at the way they're um, unloading their equipment and what equipment they've got and, and the nature of the vessel they've got. You can oftentimes tell just by looking as to whether this person has experience on open water or not. But this is a great opportunity for you to um, intervene. And, and maybe stop somebody who really doesn't know the, the, the hazard that they're exposing themselves to and have a conversation with them about the types of things they should be thinking about when they are going out on open water and, and all of the um, additional challenges that that brings along with it. So uh, one of the things that's absolutely essential if you're going to be farther from shore than you can swim to shore is you need to be able to execute a self-rescue. And a couple of the essential components to be able to do that are a, a dewatering system of some sort. Uh, so you can see here on, on the picture on the top, we have a, a pump uh, that can be used. Uh, one of the other things that I find is excellent at taking a lot of water out of a boat fairly quickly and surprisingly quickly is if you've got a decent, uh, a decent sponge, you can get a lot of water out of a boat uh, pretty fast with one of those. If you're going out on open water, uh, even if it's on a calm day, conditions can change very quickly. Uh, you know, you might be on the lee side of an island and things are great and it's very calm. Uh, depending on the tidal conditions, you go out of the lee of the island and you're crossing a channel to another island, especially if there's some boat traffic and some chop. All of a sudden, you can find yourself going from flat, calm conditions to you're in three to four foot chop and you got water that's breaking over your deck. And if it's breaking over your deck and you don't have a spray skirt on, it can roll right up that deck and, and fill up your cockpit and the stability of your boat decreases dramatically as soon as you get a few inches of, of water into that boat. So anybody that's going on open water, uh, especially on ocean open water, should absolutely be having a, a spray skirt with them. And when you're talking to paddlers about using spray skirts, one of the really important things is all of these spray skirts have a grab handle on the front of the spray skirt. And when that is, uh, when the spray skirt is secured to the cockpit, the paddler should be checking every time to make sure that that grab handle is on the outside so that if they do need to do a wet exit, they can reach forward and grab onto that grab handle and get themselves out of the, the cockpit pretty quickly. Uh, there are some techniques that we teach um, paddlers about how to do different types of releases of the spray skirt. If the grab handle is not accessible to them, uh, they can do what we call a, a hip release. Uh, but it, the easiest way for somebody to release that uh, spray skirt is if that grab handle is on the outside. Always a very good idea to bring along a spare paddle. Um, I've broken paddles while, while doing uh, rescues. Um, and I've come across paddlers who have broken paddles. I've been able to get myself out of trouble and get other paddlers out of trouble by having a spare paddle 
with me that I can share with that other paddler and help them get back to shore. So it's always a good idea to bring a spare paddle and make sure that if they do have a spare paddle on their deck, that that spare paddle is secured well to the deck. Because again, if they get into choppier conditions, that paddle can easily get uh, twisted and, and, and uh, bent off the deck and it can become a um, destabilizing uh, effect on the boat if it's dragging in the water and they're not able to uh, get it under control. So make sure that if they do have spare paddles that they have a way to secure it tightly to the deck. Up here in Maine, it is not uncommon for us to be offshore and to have a fog bank come in and all of a sudden your visibility is gone. Uh, you need to have a way to be able to determine the direction that you're traveling in. Uh, so we recommend that people have either um, handheld GPS devices or navigation devices. Uh, and then the old reliable compass and chart is always a good thing to have in case the technology fails for whatever reason. Another really important thing uh, for paddlers to, to understand and know how to do is how to render assistance to another paddler who's in, in difficulty. Uh, having a uh, tow system is a very good idea. Um, this is an example of a quick release uh, tow belt that you wear essentially like a, a fanny pack around your, your waist. It's got that little red knob on there that if you are towing another uh, kayak, and that other kayak starts to uh, sink, or if uh, a boat is crossing your, your line, you know, crossing over your tow line, you wanna be able to separate yourself from that tow line quickly. So having one of these uh, quick release uh, tow, tow rope systems is a very good way to be able to uh, render assistance to another vessel, but also keep yourself safe. Uh, aside from having a tow line, uh, it's good to have a float bag or uh, a foam float block that you can uh, bring with you. Uh, you secure that to your deck along with your dewatering de device. And if you do have to perform a self rescue, you can attach that to your paddle blade and give yourself a stabilizing uh, outrigger on the boat to help yourself get back into it. And again, if you're going, especially if you're going offshore or you're going into open water, I'm uh, always talking to people about how can you get help if you need it? And a lot of people will point out that they have cell phones and I'll say, well, that's great. Uh, it's good that you have a cell phone. Is the cell phone uh, going to work if it gets wet? Do you have a way to keep that cell phone dry if your boat capsizes? Are you going to be able to operate that cell phone if you're in the water? Uh, and if you use the cell phone, who are you calling and how far away is that person? I recommend to people that it's a great idea to have a uh, marine handheld VHF radio that's waterproof and floatable. And that way they can put out a call on channel 16. And they're not just calling a, a rescue station that may be miles away. They're calling every other vessel on the water. And the vessel that might be close, closest to them could be only a few hundred yards away and can render assistance in minutes. Um, so when you're in uh, very cold water like we have up here in Maine, minutes matter. So there's a lot of uh, commercial fishermen that are out on the water that are constantly monitoring Channel 16, and they can come to your help much, much more quickly than the Coast Guard or, or, or the Coast Guard Auxiliary can get to a person to assist them. Having a personal locator beacon is also another really important tool to have when you are going offshore. So uh, section five of the uh, vessel safety check form, uh, uh, this is an opportunity for you to have a more in-depth dialogue with the paddler about the other types of risks they may encounter and the prevention measures that they can take. So uh, dressing for immersion, dressing for visibility, uh, having spare equipment with you, being able to repair your vessel if you need to, uh, all of these things are really, really important elements that you should be having a conversation with the paddler about. So again, up here in the Northeast, uh, one of the most important things, even in the middle of summer, at the, the warmest temperature that we will see here in Casco Bay in the middle of summer is about 60, 63 degrees water temperature. So even in the middle of August, if you are paddling out on the ocean up here, you need to be dressed for immersion. Because if you go into the water, you're going into hazardous temperatures, even in the middle of summer. 
So we will have conversations with folks about what is the appropriate type of gear to have. Um, you know, people that are paddling in the summer up here, it's a very good idea for them to have, uh, you know, a wetsuit of some sort. If you're paddling year round like I do, you absolutely got to have a dry suit and, and the right additional equipment. Uh, because right now the water temperature here in, in Maine is about 38 degrees. Um, and it is pretty, pretty brutal conditions if you end up in the water. So you better have the right equipment if, if you're going to be going out. So uh, what is the biggest early season paddling hazard that we see here in New England? Obviously, it's water temperature. Uh, it isn't until the 4th of July that the water temperature goes above 60 degrees in Casco Bay. So we are talking about year round cold water hazard here in, in the Northeast. Uh, most of the paddling season, which would run from around the 1st of May until the end of September, the water temperature fluctuates between 55 and 61 degrees. Uh, so we will talk to uh, the paddlers about what is cold shock, uh, why wearing a life jacket is critical if you have cold immersion so that you, uh, you know, I, I will talk to people about what happens when somebody experiences cold shock. Um, we lose about 20% of the people that, that die up here in paddling accidents die within the first 60 seconds due, due to cold shock. Uh, the, the thing that makes all the difference in, the, in that first 60 seconds is whether the paddler is wearing their life jacket or not. Doesn't matter how good a swimmer they are. If they experience cold shock, there's a good chance that they're going to be incapacitated very, very quickly. And the only thing that's going to keep them alive is wearing a well-fitting life jacket. Uh, so uh, cold shock can happen anytime the water temperatures are below 60 degrees. So these are the uh, survival times. Uh, so it's a good idea to know this so that you can talk to the paddlers in your area based on the water temperatures in your area at the time that you're interacting with them, just so that you can give them some sense as to uh, what their survival time would be in the water that they're gonna be operating in without the right equipment and without the right protective clothing. Just a few notes uh, about uh, stand-up paddle boards. Uh, like Mark, I am not a, a stand-up paddler. Uh, it is becoming very popular, and in particular, what I see is that the inflatable uh, stand-up paddle boards are becoming very, very popular. One of the things that stand-up paddle, paddle boarders, uh, particularly novice stand-up paddle boarders, are not aware of is that when they fall off that paddle board, unless they are wearing a leash, when they fall off, they are pushing that paddle board away from them. And then if they happen to fall off on the downwind side of that paddleboard, particularly if it's an inflatable paddleboard, that paddleboard will move away from the swimmer faster than the swimmer can swim after it. So they have the inflatable uh, paddleboards have a lot of freeboard. They sit high in the water. They're light. The wind catches them and it will push that paddleboard away from the paddler uh, very, very quickly. So the only thing that's gonna keep them in contact with that paddleboard is if they are wearing a leash attached to their ankle and that's gonna get them uh, back to their board. Uh, but again, as Mark said, with the, with the less expensive um, paddle boards, there's the problem of deflation. So they need to be able to have some way to, uh, to reinflate that paddle board if it starts to, to deflate on them. We recommend to all paddlers, especially those that are going offshore, that they file a float plan and leave that with somebody on shore that they trust, somebody who's going to be diligent and pay attention to when they were uh, supposed to uh, return to shore. Uh, that gives us a starting point uh, to look for if that person is overdue. So it's a great idea for them to uh, leave that uh, float plan with somebody or, or at the very least leave it with their vehicle in a place where it's visible uh, so that if they are overdue coming back uh, we know where to go and start searching for them. Some of the other things that are really good conversations to have with the paddlers especially if they're going into bigger bodies of water uh, is that they have adequate food and water that they bring sun protection with them because uh, a lot of the year we don't have to worry about that up here but a lot of us are not used to the sun. So when we go out on the water in, in July and August and you get those, even if you're wearing a hat, uh, that's, that's protecting your head from the sun. You're still getting the reflected rays off the water that are bouncing back up and, and they're coming at you from 
underneath as well as from above. Uh, so you got to have sun protection uh, and, and water so that you're not going to get dehydrated, especially also oftentimes we're wearing um, wetsuits or dry suits because the water temperature is extremely cold, but the air temperature is quite warm. So if you're paddling in 55 degree water, but it's 85 degree temp air temperature, you still want to be wearing a dry suit, but you're getting pretty hot. Uh, so you want to be able to keep yourself hydrated in, the, in those conditions. Uh, you got to be maintaining good situational awareness. Uh, you know, uh, when you go offshore, there's all kinds of hazards that you are going to encounter. There's other vessels, there's, there's rocks, there's currents, there's all kinds of stuff that you got to be paying attention to. Up in Casco Bay, when I'm paddling around uh, Portland Harbor, we have oil, oil tankers that are coming in. We have cruise ships that are coming in. Uh, and if you're crossing a channel uh, and you happen to uh, capsize your boat in the middle of a channel, that cruise ship cannot stop and that cruise ship cannot turn in time to, uh, to avoid you. Uh, so you need to really maintain good situational awareness when you're operating in, in areas where there's going to be other commercial vessels that are operating. Uh, a great thing to do is to uh, wear the gaudiest color clothing that you can get. Uh, if, it look, if it looks ugly on you, it's probably good for paddling. Ugly color boats and ugly color life jackets stand out on the water. And it's, it's not about being stylish. It's about being safe. Uh, you want to have high visibility clothing, high visibility gear. Uh, you can increase the visibility of, let's say you have a darker kayak. Uh, you can increase the visibility of that by putting reflector stickers on it. Uh, you can increase the visibility by getting a bright life jacket, getting a bright paddle. Uh, all of these things are going to increase your visibility on the water. It's a really good idea to bring uh, appropriate emergency equipment with you. Make sure that you've got some, some line, a knife, a first aid kit, a flashlight, a, a hypothermia blanket with you. These are some of the essential pieces of equipment, uh, some duct tape for repairs. Uh, these are the things that you should have with you every time that you go out. We really recommend to people if they are traveling uh, in water where they're going to be farther away from shore than they can, they can swim to shore, they need to know how to execute a, a self-rescue or an assisted rescue. Uh, a lot of the people that I talk to have absolutely no idea how to perform a self-rescue. They, they are going out and they don't have any dewatering device. They don't have a float bag. The bungee cords on their deck are, are worn out after seven or eight years in the sun. Uh, they think they're just for holding their Gatorade bottle. They have no idea what this equipment is actually for. So sometimes when I'm on shoreside, I will, I will explain to people what the equipment is, how it works, what, what it's good for. And I'll, I'll recommend to them that they take a class with an ACA certified instructor who will teach them how to use this equipment and it will dramatically increase their safety and dramatically increase their confidence on the water. We recommend that every paddler has an if found sticker attached to their boat and we explain the reasons why that that's very important. Uh, it's important because if the vessel is, is found adrift, it's a number that we can call to find out if the paddler is actually missing or if the boat just drifted away from shore. It's also a really good tool for us to have so that if the paddler is in fact missing, we can perhaps contact somebody who knows where they started, where they were traveling to, what time they were there, and it gives us a starting point for our search. We also recommend that people, uh, especially if they're going offshore, that they uh, paddle with a friend. Uh, so Warren, I don't know if, if you recognize this spot, but I think this is a spot that you go paddling. This is uh, Kettle Cove up on Sebago Lake here in Maine. And uh, this was a morning that I was going paddling with a, with a, a few friends. And uh, it was a very foggy morning. Uh, so we stayed on shore and waited until the fog started to lift. And uh, once, it, once it started to lift, so our visibility got to about half a mile, we, we started to head out. It was forecast to get better and better. But uh, you would, should never go out on cold water without another paddler with you. There were two other people with us on this trip. They're just out of view on the left-hand side. And let me just comment, Mike. Yeah. Sebago Lake could be like open water. Yes. Uh, a large lake can be like the ocean when you're out there. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, I, I go paddling on some of the big lakes that we have up here. Moosehead Lake, um, uh, Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire. 
uh, Squam Lake. Um, you know, I was paddling on Squam Lake uh, late in the fall this past year with my wife, uh, who is not as experienced a paddler as I am. She's a, she's a good paddler, but she she's not very comfortable in, in rough conditions. And uh, if you're familiar with the movie On Golden Pond, that's uh, where uh, that it was filmed on Squam Lake in, in New Hampshire, a really beautiful lake. But we were out paddling and we were having a great time. And um, the forecast was good, but uh, I noticed that the wind was picking up and the wind just kept picking up and kept picking up. And, and I started to feel like conditions are, are changing and, and I don't like the way it's going. So I, I, we were planning to go out to some islands and I said, no, we're going to turn around. We're going to head back. And by the time we got back to shore, we had three foot waves following us in, into shore on a lake. Uh, so the, the conditions can change really, really quickly. So you want to always be paying attention to the, the weather, always be paying attention to the wind and make sure that you have somebody with you. Uh, so as Mark talked about, you know, doing vessel safety checks is a great opportunity for us to engage with the paddling public. Uh, we're ambassadors for the sport. Uh, we're safety ambassadors. Uh, it, you know, being able to engage with people in a respectful way where we're trying to um, make sure that that we're helping them, make sure that we're we're not trying to make them feel bad. We're not trying to make them feel like we're we're giving them a hard time, but we want to be just having a, a friendly conversation as one paddler to another about why some of the things that we're talking about here tonight are are critical things for them to know. And, and as one who cares about another person, you want to be able to share this information with them. So be willing to have those conversations, be willing to, um, to engage with people and, and just try and impart that knowledge that you have, because it could be the thing that saves a life. Uh, some of the additional resources that I will point out to you, there's a, a really, really good uh, Paddlecraft Vessel Safety Check Addendum that's available from the uh, V Directorate. Uh, the link to it is right here in the uh, in the presentation. And uh, just to kind of show you that this is an eight page document that if you're not super familiar with paddling, if you don't have a lot of experience, if you just take the time to uh, look at this uh, addendum, it's an eight page PDF. If you read through that, it's got all kinds of information there about uh, safety that you can use to engage the people in, in conversation. It's got all kinds of resources about the different types of paddle craft, different types of bolts, different types of equipment, different techniques. So there are great tools that are available to you, for you to use to build up your knowledge. Also keep in mind that uh, when you're having these conversations, you may be talking to somebody who might end up being a shipmate of yours. Uh, they might love the sport of paddling and they might not know very much about the auxiliary. And it's a chance for you to talk about the auxiliary and what we do and maybe even recruit somebody to join the Oxpad team in your flotilla. Use the opportunity to promote safety classes, classes taught through the ACA, classes taught through the, the auxiliary. Um, anyone can learn more. I, I don't know that there's ever been a single conversation that I've had with somebody about kayaking where I haven't learned something. Um, it, this is a great way for people to learn about safety and learn skills. Uh, if they do that, they'll have more enjoyment because they're going to know more about when to go, where to go, what to bring, all of the things that are going to make what could be a, a, a bad experience. Uh, if they have the knowledge, they can make sure that every time they go out, they're going to have a good experience. And uh, check with your local Coast Guard Auxiliary, visit the ACA websites, uh, check with paddling shops. Those are the places that they can go to find out where these classes are being offered. So as we get to the end here, I just want to throw out a question for everybody. Who can tell me, what are the U.S. Coast Guard core values? We have three core values. Can anybody tell me what they are? All right. They are honor, honor, respect, respect, and devotion, devotion to duty. You got it exactly. And for me, that is the, the 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 really the key the key one here when it comes to interacting with the with the paddlers that we're going to be talking to is respect. If you give respect, you will get respect. And when we're talking to folks, we need to talk to them as fellow paddlers as people that love the same thing that we love. And we wanna make sure that we're having 
engaging, respectful conversations. If we make them feel good about the, the interaction that they have with us, they are more likely to listen to the advice that we give them. They're more likely to, to go out and purchase the equipment that they're recommending that they have. So it's really just a, a cycle of respect and, and treating people with, with courtesy and dignity. I want to be respectful of people's time. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your evenings to uh, to join us. Uh, we're, we're working really hard to uh, keep this uh, to an hour uh, each time we make a presentation. So again, uh, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Mark. I think it was really very valuable. And uh, we'll get this recording posted. It'll be on the calendar for uh, the B Directorate uh, Oxpad Paddlecraft Safety. Uh, it's a little bit of a search to find that, but uh, if you have trouble finding it, just send me an email and I'll, I'll get you the link. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for making it happen. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.